Good. So hello there, friends. Welcome to um, Lab at Home. We hope you will help lead the program with your uh, own questions and thoughts and ideas uh, in the moderated chat box. Um, today we are uh, doing the second part of our series, uh, Lab Before Time on Prehistoric Science, and we are talking about dinosaurs. So I know that is that's something that a lot of people know a lot about. I bet all of you know tons of really cool stuff about. It's something that I'm still learning about, so it's really exciting to get to learn new things about it. Um, I would love if any of you uh, could, uh, if there are any like cool facts about dinosaurs that you know, if you might share them in the chat with us, then maybe we can kind of shout out some of them during the program. We'd love to be able to do that because I love learning new things. Um, here with me, I am really, really excited to have um, my friend Mandy Koch, who is our kind of resident paleobiology expert and dinosaur enthusiast. So she has uh, kind of some cool um, history with dinosaurs, and I was, I was hoping maybe she could tell us a little bit about the dino science she's done before. Yeah, absolutely. I'm super happy to be here in the lab at home. Thank you for having me, Peregrine. Um, so I, uh, my focus in college was paleobiology and specifically I'm really interested in dinosaurs. Um, and so I did a couple internships at the North Carolina Museum of Natural Sciences in downtown Raleigh. Um, I have some fun pictures um, that we can maybe pull up and see from that time, but I worked in the paleontology lab um, at that museum. Um, and so here's a couple pictures of me opening up plaster jackets that have some fossils inside of them, um, using a buzz saw to open those, and we use paintbrushes and tools that kind of look like maybe what the dentist would use to pick the plaque off your teeth. Um, and so right now, right in this picture, I'm extracting fossils from rock. Um, and the next picture, um, we can kind of see, there it is. So, uh, so this is a plaster jacket that has a vertebrae inside of it. And so I extracted all of the bones out of there. Um, and then once you extract the bones, you have to put them together, kind of like a puzzle. Um, and so you use acetate to kind of glue the pieces together. And this is the finished vertebrae um, that I put together. This is a great question about what is a vertebrae exactly? That's a great question. Um, so a vertebrae is a backbone. Um, and so this particular vertebrae is from an aetosaur, um, which is not a dinosaur, but it's a really ancient reptile that lived before dinosaurs lived. Um, so this particular vertebrae is about 300 million years old. Wow, and, and that's the actual, that's the actual fossilized that is, vertebrae. Yeah, that is the actual fossil. It's not a cast, which is what you might see up in museums for displays, but that is the actual fossil. It's very fragile um, because it's very old. That's really, really cool. And, and I, I just wanted to ask one more thing um, about the plaster jacket. What is that? Yeah. So I know probably in some movies and TV shows, you might have seen paleontologists out in the field and they just dig up bones straight up from the ground and then take the bones back to the museums. But it actually, they're actually very fragile fossils. And so what paleontologists do is they pour plaster around the bone, but also around the surrounding rock that the bone is in. Um, and then they will transport that entire big plaster jacket back to the museum and the lab. And then you break open the jacket with a buzz saw. Um, and then you use your various tools to get the, the bone out of the rock. So that's really amazing. It's like wrapped up in a little to go container. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. That's really incredible. So you've touched actual dinosaur bones. I've definitely never done that. Um, yeah. But that's, that is so cool. I know that you know a ton about dinosaurs, and I'm sure that a lot of our friends here watching know a ton about dinosaurs. Um, I know that, Mandy, we were talking the other day about dinosaurs and kind of like the things that we do know and, and also the things that we don't know that scientists uh, are still trying to figure out. And we kind of, uh, or at least I learned, that scientists are still trying to figure out how dinosaurs may have sounded. 
Um, so I thought that could be something um, cool to talk about uh, in Lab at Home. And uh, I thought we could talk about some of kind of the latest research about uh, the sounds that dinosaurs made and, and maybe make some sounds ourselves because the way that we make sound is, is pretty interesting, I think. So I might pose this question to all of you, uh, all of our viewers. What, I mean, what is sound, first of all? Not just talking or anything. What is sound in general? What do you think? When you break it down, what is sound? We know that it's something that we hear with our ears. We know it's something we can make with our bodies, right? We can, we can talk. We can also do things like clap. We can whistle. We can do other things like that. And sound itself is a vibration. So kind of something shaking a little bit. And you can feel this if you will touch, gently touch your neck and just say something. You can just say, hello, my name is Peregrine. Um, and it's something you can kind of feel this kind of tickling, rumbling in your throat because those are the vibrations that are making the sound. So some animals, including humans, um, make sound using our breath. Yeah, exactly, a vibration. We make those vibrations using our breath. So we breathe in, and then we move it through another part of our body, right? Kind of right out of our throat. Um, but we're not just blowing air out, right? Something I was doing earlier as I was gently touching my throat, and I was, at first I was swallowing, so I'll swallow. And I kind of felt something move a little bit when I did that. And then I noticed, especially if I say something really up high, and then I say something really down low, I noticed like this movement in my throat when I'm saying it. So I have this whole structure here, um, sometimes called a voice box. Um, I was calling it specifically the larynx. We had this, this cool machinery here that takes our breath and transforms it into sounds that we use to communicate. Oh, it sounds like, Varun, you were learning about sound in school. That's perfect. If you want to add anything that you learned in school, we would love to, to hear what you're thinking. Um, we know that we uh, humans and many other mammals make sound this way, but it's a little hard to think about what exactly is going on inside of our larynx or inside of our voice box when we're making sound. So I don't know if any of you um, have any of the things from our materials list to kind of do our experiment with us today. But I have a balloon, and I thought we could start with the balloon when we're thinking about what exactly makes the sound in our throat, what makes those vibrations. So we know we're taking breath in. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to blow my balloon up a little bit. So there's my, there's the breath. And we're saying the neck of the balloon is kind of like your neck, right? It's kind of the holes where the air comes out of and goes into. And we're talking about two kind of this, this special part uh, right up here, right at the very kind of opening there. We're pinching it together. And that's almost exactly like our, uh, our larynx looks, our vocal cords look. They're kind of these uh, like muscular structures that open and close according to how we move our throat. So this isn't gonna sound like a person, but it is gonna make a noise. And the vibration comes from how I move the fold between here, right? How these two pieces that are touching, how they're gonna move apart, right? Ready? Here we go. What? <laughs> that's awfully loud. <laughs> so I don't know if any of you are able to make any of these fun sounds, but that's a loud one. That's, that's not how people sound because our vocal uh, folds, our vocal cords are, are differently shaped and we're pushing air through at different speeds, at different, right, like volumes and pitches. But that's the idea is that there's vibration going on between um, the, this kind of little, it's almost like a little mouth itself that's opening and closing and shaping the air and affecting the way that the air vibrates. So Mandy, do we think that dinosaurs sounded like a deflated balloon? Probably not. <laughs> um, Typically, you know, like again, in movies and TV shows, we've seen dinosaurs, per, you know, they seem like they roar, they make big 
big kind of roars like lions would or something like that. But in actuality, they probably um, weren't able to roar um, and they probably didn't really open their mouth to make sound, you know, like a lion would or even um, some other type of animals. So, um, you know, you mentioned that we don't really know how dinosaurs make sound and that's a really big thing about paleontology is it's all based around making hypotheses and educated guesses because we didn't live around the time of dinosaurs so we can't know for sure um, and so one way that we can kind of start to learn about how dinosaurs lived or made sound is by looking at animals that live today that might be closely related to dinosaurs or even animals that live today that are dinosaurs. Um, so does anybody know what animal group today, there's a whole bunch of them that actually are dinosaurs. Does anybody have a guess as to what type of animal is a dinosaur that lives today? So a still living dinosaur. Ooh. Yeah, Stephanie, birds, exactly. So birds are dinosaurs which is awesome to think about when you look outside your window and you see all these birds, you're looking at dinosaurs. Um, and so we know that birds have syrinxes, which are their vocal organs that are kind of like their larynx. And their syrinxes has those vocal folds that Peregrine was talking about. Um, and so we know that bird syrinxes are located near their heart and near their lungs. And so they're able to expel a lot of sound and they're able to make those really cool songs that you might hear early in the morning. Um, and so that's how birds make sound. But it's unlikely that dinosaurs had syrinxes. Um, we know that a bunch of ancient birds have had syrinxes, but we think that syrinxes evolved as dinosaurs evolved into birds. Um, so eliminating birds, we can kind of look at crocodiles and alligators and think that dinosaurs are probably made sounds more similar to them. And they have larynxes. Um, and so their larynx like ours is in their throat and crocodiles and alligators can make a real, some deep bellows and guttural sounds. They can hiss. Um, and so that's probably more like the sounds that dinosaurs would have made. So really deep rumblings. I know that I was, um, I was listening to some of those sounds and they are very, they kind of grab me by the brainstem. <laughs> they, are, they are really interesting sounds. I would encourage all of you to check some of those out after our lab at home. Um, so we think they probably sounded a bit more uh, like crocodiles with their rumbling and their hissing and bellowing is a really good word. Um, but then maybe as they're evolving into birds, they start evolving more uh, of a syrinx, is that right? Yes, definitely as they evolve into birds, they develop more complex vocal um, organs like the syrinx and they're able to create um, more songs and higher frequency kind of chirps that birds would make. Um, so yeah, definitely with that evolution into birds, we see the evolution of the vocal system, if you will. I love that. I love that. Let's talk a little bit more about a syrinx, right? So we said our lar larynx, our larynx, our um, little voice box there, right? Kind of, we have breath from our lungs, it all pushes up here, and it moves through that, those folds, and it makes that noise kind of like the balloon. Well, different because we're made of different stuff than a balloon, but in the same way that those two little flaps of the balloon's neck vibrated, that's how our voices are made. But for birds, it's a little different. It's sort of like they have, they have like, right, like two different tubes going on. It's sort of maybe like a double larynx going on. So I thought that we could maybe make some sounds that are a little bit different or a little bit similar rather to the sounds that birds make and we could make it out of a straw um, and also using some scissors. Um, this is something fun that I learned to do a little while ago. I thought um, we could make two of them since we know that uh, a syrinx has two tubes. So what we'll do is we'll take our, our straw 
and we're going to cut it in half. We're going to do the same thing to each side um, because uh, we're, we're just making two of the same thing, right? What we're going to do is we're going to cut a little point into it. I'll show you one that I've already made to show you the shape that I made. So it kind of has this little double, it almost looks like a little beak here. I cut off a little bit here and a little bit here and it made a really sharp point and I didn't want to poke myself. So then I cut off a tiny bit up here. So I'll show you all what this looks like. Um, what I'm gonna do is fold it just a little bit, just kind of pinch it at the top to help give me a line to cut on. And then I'm gonna do a snip here and turn it over and do a snip on the other side as well. And I'll give it a little bit of a snip on top just to make sure it's not too pointy. So I've created a shape like this and this is kind of those two sides that are gonna be vibrating together. I'm gonna to use my mouth to make this sound in just a second. And what I'm gonna do is kind of hold it between my teeth or lips um, where I can just kind of pinch it together like that but not totally closed, just almost closed, and then I'm gonna blow through it. It's something that sometimes you have to try a couple times to get the right sound out, but I'll show you what it sounds like. Hopefully I can make it go. <laughs> like a kazoo. <laughs> so there's a lot of really interesting sounds you can make with this. I don't know if it sounds loud to you guys, but it's a pretty loud sound. Um, I'm gonna make two of them. That might even be more loud than just one. And um, then I'm going to see if I can blow them both at the same time. I don't know if, if any of you are following along with our experiment, but I would encourage you guys to try that. So I'm going to cut another one. And I'm not too worried about making them exactly the same because birds can make kind of two different sounds at once, right? Because isn't it like one lung per tube or something? Yeah, absolutely. So one tube is kind of connected to each lung so they can start making one sound and then use their other tube to kind of make a whole different sound. And sometimes they can actually make the two sounds at once. That's, that's really cool. I wish I could make two sounds at once. I know. I know. I know there's kind of some special techniques that maybe you could study a lot and learn about like Mongolian throat singing to do multiple sounds. Yeah. I can't do that. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm going to give this a try. Um, I'm going to try to do both of them at once. I'll do, I'll test this one out, my new one. <laughs> so sometimes it's a little, I'm going to make my flaps a tiny bit shorter. See how mine are a little bit longer? I'm going to see if that helps me out. This one works. <laughs> Let's see if we can get this one to go. That one's really good. And I made one earlier. Maybe, um, maybe it's just the sort of thing where you kind of have to, I noticed that this one has kind of a bigger point at the top than this one. It's just something, this is something you have to tinker with a little bit. It's trial and error. Some of them work, some of them don't. You can figure out exactly what works best for you. I'm gonna try this one. There we go. <laughs> so here's two different ones. I'm not sure if I can get them both to go at the same time. But let's think. It's very noisy. This is a great one to do outside. Ooh, did you hear that one? That was a weird one. It sounded like an elephant almost. So <laughs> that's a bunch of different, that's a cacophony of noise. That's a, just an explosion of crazy noises. Um, that we could make. Um, and you can try seeing if different lengths make different qualities of sound. <laughs> I found out that that one's a little bit lower. Um, that these, since they were shorter, I think that has a little bit to do with why it is um, a little bit higher, maybe. Um, and it just depends on where kind of you're squeezing it with your lips, I think. <laughs> it's kind of like a clarinet. 
Yeah, or like a kazoo or something. Exactly, and it, and they work much the same way. It's just kind of these little pieces that are vibrating as I'm, let's see if I yeah. can, there we go. They're just kind of vibrating, right, as I'm blowing, They're vibrating really quickly. So that's maybe a little bit what a syrinx is like. Um, and so we, we talked about, right, like using a balloon to be a little bit like uh, a larynx, a larynx, um, and we talked about using some straws for a syrinx. And then I wanted to talk about one more way that we think that some dinosaurs may have made sounds. This isn't every single one of them, but some special species did maybe make sound this way. And I was wondering if you could tell us about that, Mandy. Yeah, absolutely. So some dinosaurs had, you've probably seen it, they had crests on their heads. Um, and you probably wondered, what is that for? Like Parasaurolophus or Lambiosaurus kind of had two crests on its head. And so we think, or paleontologists think, that these crests probably could have been used to make sound. And so they found that these crests are full of little passages. And so the way it would work is when the dinosaur would breathe in, air would fill up in their crest. And then when they were breathing out, it would make kind of a... those sounds. That is so amazing and it, it, it it's maybe sounds a little bit like when you blow air um, across the top of something like a bottle because it's like the air is going in here and it's resonating. Absolutely yes. Yeah vibrating all in there and I thought um, I don't know if any of you have They make different So that sounds a little different. That was a higher one. That's interesting. Higher pitch. Um, and then I have I have a little tiny test tube that makes an interesting one. <laughs> oh wow it's, nice. it's so much smaller i guess yeah. the bigger it is i think the lower the sound because the vib the vibrations are going a little bit kind of slower oh this is a great point the longer tubes have a lower pitch than the shorter tubes and my friend Rowan was referencing like it's like a pan flute so i don't know if you've ever seen those different kinds of flutes that have a bunch of different pipes on them i'm gonna make one out of straws here it looks a little bit like this and you would blow across the top of them. Oh, this is great. Bottle caps also work. Uh, and also acorns, acorn caps can work. Yeah, so you, you're blowing your breath and it's kind of making it vibrate a little bit. And, and that's what the sound is. So there's so many different things. I was trying um, to whistle with my hands earlier. Have you ever done that before, Mandy? I have not. I can't even whistle normally, so. Oh. I don't know if I could whistle through my hand. I can't do it with my lips, no. <laughs> well, it takes some practice for sure. Yeah. I know it took me some practice. So I can whistle a little bit. I'm not the best whistler. And then earlier I was trying to do it with my hands as well. The idea is that we were kind of making a completely closed kind of circle. And then we were only letting a little tiny bit of oh, air. Yeah. Uh, it's almost like, right, vocal. Vocal cords. Exactly. Yeah. Let me yeah. see if I can get it to go. Huh. So that, that goes pretty well. And I'm just blowing right here, but I'm making sure that's this is the only place where any air is getting out. So that's another way that we can make some sound. And I like feeling the way that the sound vibrates. That's even a little bit similar to how we're saying some kinds of dinosaurs used the crests on their head to yeah, vibrate sound. Definitely, definitely. Vibration is a huge part of sound. And I wanted to, um, I, I have a kind of a little clip here that I wanted to share of a recreation of the Parasaurolophus sound um, that scientists uh, took kind of 3D scans of a fossil of one of the crests that they found. And they kind of simulated uh, what it would sound like. And I'm gonna see if I can get this to play for you all. Let's see. 
That's so interesting. It sounds like a tuba. A tuba. <laughs> I was just about to say that a tuba, yeah. or like a horn, or like a fog horn. Yeah, something like that. Definitely. Um, yeah. No, God, sorry. I just can see that's that's so cool. We've made some sounds that maybe don't sound exactly like a dinosaur, but use some of the same ways that dinosaurs might have made sound, especially um, when we're talking about making a sound like we make sort of with our, with our larynxes, but much lower. Uh, and also when we're talking about um, blowing across a bottle to make a really, uh, a, a really good vibration, a really good reverberation of sound. So we only have a minute or so left, but I wondered if any of you have any more questions about, uh, about dinosaurs for Mandy or any questions about some of the paleontology work that she's done. I know I wanted to know, um, Mandy, what did you do with the dinosaur bones once you were finished cleaning them and putting them back together? Yeah, so the, the Museum of Natural Sciences has a huge basement um, and it's just full of fossil specimen. And so we, when we finish a fossil, it would kind of get um, cat, you know, cataloged and would go down into their basement. And then there's just walls and walls of plaster jackets that need to be opened. Um, and so the hope is that, you know, you can start to connect the different, like we could might find another vertebrae in a different plaster jacket and you could eventually connect enough fossils to make a full skeleton that you could then um, make casts of and then put up in the museum for everyone to see. Um, but yeah, for the most part, they get cataloged and then they're down in the museum's collection of fossils. That's really great. That's so funny. So you are kind of putting together a puzzle, not only yeah. inside of the plaster jacket, but with multiple plaster jackets. Exactly. And that's a part of why I loved working in the lab because I love doing puzzles at home and it's very similar. Um, I love that. Um, we have a question here from Esther asking, do dinosaurs say roar? What do we think? Well, they probably didn't roar, <laughs> um, but as we've talked about, they might have made lower kind of horn-like sounds. They could hiss probably. Um, and another thing, another way that modern day reptiles like crocodiles and alligators make sounds is they swoosh their tails or they rub their scales together or they clap their jaws. Um, and so these are not really dealing with the larynx or the syrinx, but they're kind of more using their bodies to make sound. Um, so that's another way that many dinosaurs might have communicated with each other. That's so interesting. I guess we were just saying when we were defining sound, like we can yeah. talk, but we can also clap and do other things. Oh, this is a great connection, Max, like how crickets grind their legs together to make sound. Exactly. Or how we might snap our fingers, right? Exactly. The sound of our finger hitting our hand. That's really cool. So we're seeing there are vocal or using our voice, using our breath, they're using their breath, right, to make uh, communications, but also using their environment and also using their bodies to make sound. That's so interesting. And, and I love that it's such a, a puzzle. You have so much detective work to do because we don't have time machines and we can't go all the way back. But it sounds to me, Mandy, like you've done a lot of really amazing research that helps us get some pretty good ideas about what uh, life might have been like for dinosaurs and what they might have looked like, sounded like, and maybe even acted like. That's so cool. Um, this is about all the time we have for today, but we do have one more installment of our uh, Lab Before Time series, and it's going to be on bugs, prehistoric bugs, and how bugs and flowers evolved together. So um, be on the lookout for that one. I would love to see you all um, next week, uh, Wednesday, at this, this same time, 4 p.m. Um, I'd love for all of you to, to maybe join me in thanking Mandy so, so much for being here. Mandy, I really appreciated your insight and your knowledge, because as I said, I'm still learning a lot about dinosaurs, and you have such great knowledge and experience. You're welcome. I had such a good time. Maybe I can come back one day and talk. I hope about so. Dinosaurs. I hope so.
because you're my go-to if I ever have any dinosaur questions. Awesome. So uh, that's a, a lot of fun uh, today, friends. I hope that you had as much fun as I did. Um, and thank you so, so much for your time. I hope we might see you again next week at 4 p.m. to talk about bugs and blossoms. See you next time, friends. Bye.